recording. And I love boas. Red tail boas are super cool. They're beautiful snakes. They're so variable. They're pretty striking. Their pattern is um, usually pretty appealing to people. They're very strong. They're jungle animals. They're kind of like that representation of rainforest. And they're very common both as pets and in collections. So I thought that that would be a good species to take a look at. So <laughs> I was just going to talk about my background. Um, I've worked in the zoo field since I was a teenager. Um, and I started out as a tour guide. So I started out with public speaking, speaking about reptiles, educating about reptiles. And that was where my focus was for about 13 years of my career. Um, when I moved back to Illinois from Texas, um, I started working at Henson Robinson Zoo, which is in Springfield, Illinois. And I started out as a keeper and I got the opportunity to move into management. And um, I've learned quite a bit over the last few years. Um, reptiles are still my passion. Um, and I miss them being like my sole focus, but I'm able to share uh, information with my staff that might be newer to keeping reptiles. And that's been pretty fulfilling as well. Um, currently, I do this content through uh, my side business, which is Animal Husbandry Evolved. And that was the um, account that this event was created on. And while I have no problem representing my institution, um, I think it was important for me um, with some of the stronger opinions that I have to align myself with myself. Um, I am very respectful when I speak about husbandry issues and things that I've seen because keeping reptiles um, is a, a pretty complex and a lot of times we're given limited resources to provide um, high quality care. And the biggest limited resource I would say um, a lot of times is with exhibit space. So reptile houses are always kind of gallery style, and there's really not a lot of ways that you can expand enclosures um, or change out enclosures because a lot of the times they're built into um, the building infrastructure. And that can create challenges, especially when you're trying to provide for a certain exhibit species, and you might have obviously limited options with where those animals can go. And so I've been in many situations throughout my career where I've had um, uh, access to sufficient resources in terms of space, and sometimes you're just limited. And there's ways that you can enhance reptiles' lives in those situations, and that's what I spend most of my time talking about. This photo is me from when I was in high school. This is a graduation photo with a red-tailed boa. <laughs> so I, I've always loved them. They're fantastic. I was thinking, do I have a photo with a red tail? And I do, and it's me from half a lifetime ago. So I just want to shamelessly plug for people that aren't familiar with my content. I do classes. Um, right now, the published classes that I have available, which are all pre-recorded, um, are, oh my goodness, the first one I did was on Varanids. I alligator nutrition, uh, recently finished uh, tegu care and welfare class, and then some individual kind of welfare webinars on blue tongue skinks, bearded dragons, and leopard geckos. And then coming up, I have a series, which I'm actually thinking about just making that one free because it's very important for the field and for the hobby, which is identifying uh, appropriate practices on social media. There's been uh, obviously, social media is everywhere, and there's a lot of reptiles present, a lot of reptile institutions present on social media, uh, a lot of private keepers, and it's important to be able to identify not so much the glaringly obvious practices like that come down to safety, but also um, there's some subtleties to things that you see on social media that I think people should be aware of. And so I was thinking of making this into a class, but as I'm putting it together, I feel like it definitely should be more open access, even if it takes me a lot of time. I have an alligator and a common snapping turtle class free, just like this one, um, on the 10th. And then there's going to be a big series throughout this year that I'm going to do on terrestrial invertebrates because I absolutely love bugs. And then I'm going to be speaking for ZAA, blah, blah, blah. I can't, I, <laughs> I can't stand promoting myself, but I also uh, have realized the extent of content that I've made. And if you need any more information on that or those materials, please let me know. So in this talk, 
Um, if you have not attended my talks before, they're usually extremely lengthy. They average at two hours, and that's because I don't, I'm not strict with myself and I can't stop talking. Um, I'm, the other aspect is when I put together talks, they're usually like 70 slides, and that, is, that was probably the, the issue I'm realizing now. So I want to get this done um, in about half an hour to focus on some of the main points, um, but I tend to kind of get going and I talk quickly, so that's also why I'm going to be recording this so you can look back at it. Um, but I tend to have a lot to say even when I try to kind of cinch it down. And so I'll go through my material and then if you guys have any questions at the end that you wanna put in the chat, um, I'd be glad to answer. I know a lot about snake keeping, but I don't know everything. And if I don't have the answer, I can certainly help you find the literature that can get you your information. But for this talk, I already hear the cat's jingle ball going. That's another thing. She plays very loudly in the living room when I'm teaching. So we're going to be focusing on welfare. And I've done a lot of content on reptile welfare recently. And a majority of their welfare, general welfare, comes from how they're housed. So they're, they're ectotherms, meaning they get a majority of their resources, including body heat, that's the biggest one, uh, externally. And so how you set up their environment and the humidity and temperature parameters, they really do affect uh, the animal's overall welfare. So when you think about snakes, most people know that snakes need heat in order to digest their food, which yes, absolutely. If you have them in an enclosure, that is really hard to heat. Um, oftentimes large, like tall, airy enclosures that um, have pretty <laughs> high ventilation, um, you can lose heat in that situation. And you have to remember that you could have a, a wonderful setup that has all the things that the snake could need uh, for expressing natural behavior, um, just a beautiful enclosure aesthetically for guests. But if the heat isn't high enough in that enclosure and stable enough, and if the humidity is not uh, up to standards for the particular species, you're going to run into uh, issues with just their physiological functioning. And you can't really make up for that um, through a beautiful enclosure. And so a lot of their welfare is influenced by those parameters. It's influenced by the opportunities and the choice that they get. Um, and so the biggest focus through this talk is talking about uh, enclosure design and then providing environmental parameters that really set them up for success in terms of welfare. We're gonna spend a little bit of time on feeding um, and food presentation and how that um, obviously is related to um, overall health and welfare. And then we're going to talk just a little bit about handling. This um, would normally, in normal setups for my talks, would be pretty extensive. Um, but I feel like we're going to hit on those core points. And then maybe at another time, we can expand into some big conversation. I want to note that all of the curriculum that I create is based on what's called fundamental rights. This is not animal rights. Um, it is just what the animal has a right to in exchange for being in human care. So obviously life in human care can be pretty luxurious, um, but these animals are going to be in a fairly static um, environment. They're not going to be exposed to as many variables as they would in their natural environment. And so it's important that animal care staff on all levels uh, prioritize these animals' experiences in their institutions. And so they're very basic and they are related to the five freedoms. They're related to animal welfare concepts. But because reptiles uh, depend so much on their external environment, it's very important that we keep them in mind and keeping their uh, ability of choice in mind when it comes to their temperature gradients, where they spend their time, also giving them opportunities to express natural behaviors. Um, you are really creating their entire life around them. And so it's important to have kind of a strong set of beliefs to keep in mind um, when you're working with these animals. And typically this is kind of incorporated into each subject that we talk about, but this is just, uh, these are just the ideas that I have built these talks off of. So looking at species, we're not gonna spend a huge amount of time talking about taxonomy. Um, with boa constrictors, there's a number of subspecies. Uh, even in, in most cases, boa constrictor and 
boa imperator are considered, they're still sometimes considered on the subspecies level. Um, in more recent literature, it's been suggested that there's enough of uh, variation for them to be split into main species. But either BCI or BCC, or you're going to have a boa constrictor or a red tail. And usually in a zoo setting, um, animals that aren't being used for breeding programs are not going to be some like spectacular variation, uh, regional subspecies, um, or like specific island species of boa constrictor. So this talk is just meant to address boa constrictors as they're usually encountered in a zoo setting, which is an, an, an individual or two, and they're most often either going to be these species or these subspecies, but we're not going to spend time on taxonomy so much. Um, they're mostly um, split by the, the areas where they're found, and so their regional variation in size and pattern can be a good indicator as well as uh, scale counts, but it depends on which side of the Andes that you're looking at, and there are some subtle ways to tell the differences, but in most cases it's not a concern. But for this whole complex, um, they're found in a variety of habitats. So they can be found in drier scrublands. They can be found in uh, higher elevation rainforests, but a lot of individuals are found in hot, humid rainforests. Um, and that's typically uh, outside of these specific um, separated populations. A lot of them are going to prefer, prefer a pretty specific window of temperature, which we'll talk about. Um, with snakes, it is different than lizards. I'm just going to save it till we get there to talk about <laughs> temperature variation. Anyway, sorry to refocus myself. Females are usually considerably larger than males at full size. Uh, females are usually heavier bodied, which we'll look at some examples when we talk about body condition. Um, they're very, very strong. So these boas compared to uh, terrestrial boas or a lot of types of pythons. Um, have a taller body structure. So the cross section of their body is like a loaf of bread. So they have kind of a high back, which you can see on the photo on the left. Um, they're not round bodied, like you might see in like a Dumeril's boa, for example. And that gives them a lot of uh, anchors for musculature and it gives them a strong body structure for climbing. And they are very strong. We'll talk about that when we talk about handling. These are powerful snakes, like full size, especially adult female red tail boas are very, very strong. And that strength is important because these are constrictors. And so if they're going to lead an arboreal lifestyle, they need to be able to hold on to trees so they don't fall because they are uh, capable of breaking their back, breaking their bones. So falling is the thing that they want to avoid the most. And that's something you have to keep in mind when we come to handling as well. But they are um, grabbing and constricting prey while they're elevated. So you need to be able to hold on to the branch and hold on to your food. And in some cases, uh, not even very large snakes will be catching very large prey items. It's not uncommon to see subadults um, subduing something like a macaw. It's very impressive. Um, they've been known to prey on uh, jugurundi, which is a species of cat. Um, monkeys, that's a, a common prey item. They do love birds. But they have to be strong in order to succeed as a large snake in the trees eating large prey items. They're also excellent swimmers. Most snakes can swim pretty well. Not all snakes prefer to sit in water, but boas are usually given the opportunity. And they have a pretty varied diet throughout their life, which we'll discuss. So talking about enclosure design and in content with the temperature and uh, the temperature where they're at or if they're digesting food or if it's just the time of day where they feel tired, they'll spend their time resting. And resting is is usually characterized by stillness, um, not a lot of eye movement, and no tongue flicking, so they seem relaxed. Sometimes they'll sleep in odd positions. Uh, the other behavior that you see most often, these are broad categories because we don't have a ton of time, but uh, foraging. And foraging can just kind of be, you know, exploring their enclosure. So being mobile, tongue flicking, you're obviously seeing them moving. You'll see eye movements. They'll respond to stimuli in their enclosure. And this might be moving to a cooler or warmer place. This could be looking for a darker place or elevating themselves. 
They could also be looking for water or a place to soak. And then sometimes they'll also be searching for food. So boas are fairly opportunistic. And that's why when we get to diet, you have to kind of be careful with the size and frequency of feeding because a lot of times with uh, constrictors, they're, they're gonna eat most of the time. So if you give them a choice, they're usually gonna say yes, even if it's not what's best for them. And especially with large species that are sometimes housed in a way that promotes um, like a sedentary lifestyle, you deal with obesity and a lot of reduced um, exploration behaviors, which is something that you want to see as a good a sign of good welfare is that they are they're active but not distressed. So they should be active part of the time if they're not digesting. They shouldn't spend all of their time sitting in one spot like a majority of the time. Um, there's some parameters around that, but that's just kind of normal because these are fairly active snakes. They're active during the daytime and at night. And I just wanted to make a note about drinking. Um, it's important with reptiles that you provide them with different methods of drinking, especially when it comes to uh, high humidity rainforest species. Most reptiles uh, will realize what water bowls are for, but sometimes a really good indicator that you might need to do something like hand misting is if you're hosing in their enclosure or you're misting their enclosure and they're drinking from the mister or they're drinking off their body, um, it doesn't mean that they're not drinking their bowl water, but if they are doing that, just give them a second to drink off of that mister because that is an opportunity that would be a natural stimuli to drink. Our stimulus to drink would be something like rain or dew, and that behavior uh, along with like their skin condition can give you a pretty good reading on their hydration level, which is important, um, especially when you are looking at the environmental parameters in terms of temperature. If the temperature is too high and the humidity, humidity is too low, you're gonna run into shedding issues. Um, you also run into just like general dehydration, which you tend to see. Uh, I don't have any photos of it, but dehydrated snakes look, you could tell there's something wrong typically, but giving them the opportunity to drink, especially in a natural way, like from raindrops or misting, um, is something that you want to encourage as well if the steak wants to partake. Sometimes they don't like to be sprayed. So space. Boas are big. Uh, they used to be part of the big five, but there are a lot of species that are kind of longer on average, um, but especially female red-tailed boas can get large, and their size is just so variable. It really depends both on like some of the regional subspecies are smaller or larger and then uh, captive bred red tail boas obviously they get a lot of food compared to wild ones and you can get some abnormally large individuals there but in general space is going to be the first resource that is important for any animal so snakes and other reptiles tend to be pretty tolerant of limited space what's most important when it comes to smaller enclosures and having less space is making sure that you can still provide a gradient. So if you have a red-tailed boa in an enclosure where they can't necessarily stretch out all the way, you need to make sure that the environmental parameters in there sit in their preferred range and give them the ability to meet or to uh, go through their physio physiological processes, that they're able to digest their food, uh, that they're able to be active, that they're able to have a strong immune system. Um, and small enclosures are easy to overheat um, and they are also easy to dry out. And so that kind of causes more um, issues on a smaller scale. And so if you have a lot of space, it can give you more freedom to create the humidity and temperature gradient that you want. Um, it's a lot more important in species that live in a more variable uh, situation or where their basking, preferred basking temperature is extremely uh, high, so like in varanids. But with boas, they tend to sit at a pretty constant temperature. Uh, they do sit in pools, so it's important that this snake is able to submerge. A lot of large snakes do like sitting in water, resting in water. Um, it does take a lot of the weight off of their musculature, their skeleton sy skeletal system. And uh, large enclosures allow you to create more 
kind of dynamic situations where you might have more than one boa or you might have more than one species. That also comes with risks too, which we'll talk about. So enclosure design, this is a lot of information that you can obtain from um, even from like reptile care websites. But overall, the ambient temperature usually sits pretty regularly uh, between 80 and 90 degrees. And so you want to provide somewhere in there with some variation, which is normal, especially with like screen top enclosures, or if there's more than one wall that's screen, it can be really variable. Um, but you don't wanna keep them at a low temperature and then also have it be very humid. And that can create a lot of issues, uh, respiratory issues and skin issues as well. It just leaves them more susceptible to infection because a lower temperature does um, impede their immune system and being warmer, boosts it. And so it makes sense that if they're too cool and then you have too cool and wet conditions that it's going to create uh, health issues. And these snakes are, they're found all over. I mean, it's very hard to say that like these snakes live at a certain, you know, height off the ground and, and this temperature and that temperature. They seem to do best over probably decades now of keeping boas, they do best in the 80 to 90 degree range. And if you provide a basking spot, it's only a few degrees higher than that ambient temperature. And so snakes kind of prefer to live in environments where their body temperature is, is even if there's like a winter period, that when they're active, they stay within a certain range and they'll bask to accommodate that, but they're not like high hot spot baskers like you see in cro some crocodilians like you see in some lizards and so you want to make sure if you provide a basking spot that it doesn't launch the temperature too high or that the animal doesn't receive a thermal burn from a heating unit um, and that you're not drying out the enclosure because humidity and temperature is a balance and then you also oftentimes have to factor in ventilation. Um, you don't want a sopping wet soaking exhibit that's going to grow mold and fungus and bacteria. Um, there has to be a, a balance and every enclosure is going to be different and sometimes it takes some time to uh, figure those things out, especially in a, in a weird shaped enclosure, a very tall one, a very have respiratory issues and more dry uh, situations as well. So species that are from like uh, desert habitats can easily develop skin issues in a humid environment. That's not what they were adapted to withstand. And boas are in the opposite spectrum where they they there are populations that are adapted for living in um, environments that are very different from the rainforest. But if you have some of these more common species, uh, they're going to prefer those rainforest uh, temperatures and humidity. So talking about humidity, you don't want it to be 100% all the time. Um, too, too wet with too low a ventilation definitely causes respiratory issues, especially in large snakes. That's one thing that um, I've talked about in the past in large constrictor care is that a lot of times these snakes can get so big that it's hard for them to heat their entire body and their enclosures are so big it's really hard to heat the entire space to get those animals to those temperatures. And so you see a lot of respiratory issues in large constrictors and um, that is usually the result of long term um, parameters that are outside of their preferences. It's not usually a quick turn, but if they're living in an environment that is constantly wet and there's no ventilation and you're not really having any air turnover, um, that over time can create major health issues. Live plants can help increase humidity. Um, you want to have a substrate mixture that promotes humidity, but don't let it become soaking. So you don't want sopping wet. Um, substrate that's just a breeding ground for all sorts of nasty things. And then hand misting um, or while you're watering plants, that increases humidity. A lot of times if you have a large enclosure, you can kind of like heavy mist it or hose it. And by the end of the day, it's on the drier side. That variation is, uh, is good for reptiles because in the wild, they would have rainfall. It might dry out and have another rainstorm, that type of thing. And so varying um, the amount of water that you missed or if you have a misting system or if you do like rain chambers, 
that type of thing um, is enriching to these animals because they're they're always in a hot humid environment but sometimes they're going to have that uh, increased rainfall so we're going to look at a couple of examples for enclosures and um, these enclosures are just examples of a lot of the things that zoos kind of have to deal with um, in some situations, you have enclosures that are built specifically for a species of reptile, and that can kind of corner you because then it might be difficult to provide uh, everything another species would need just because the cement work in it doesn't provide the right uh, um, height or floor space. There's a lot of issues. I don't know. Zoos are all different, and reptile exhibits tend to be pretty challenging. So in this enclosure, which I have the links in the slides, um, we won't go into specific uh, institutions because it doesn't really matter, but I saw multiple examples of boa constrictors in with green anacondas, which this is an example of one of those enclosures. I find that very interesting because boas and a lot more snakes than we used to think really do opportunistically feed on other snakes. And there's typically a size where it becomes kind of impossible for them to consume prey, um, but that doesn't always keep them from trying. More subtle competition for resources like basking spots, things like that. And that's why in most cases you wanna house reptiles singly unless they have the resources because no matter what you do, it's been shown in alligators or maybe it was more or less crocodiles, that if a a pair of animals is raised in the same enclosure with the same access to resources and eat the same amount of food, you will still have a dominant and subordinate and there's actually going to be a size and body condition difference between them as well. So this, their presence with each other can create stress that you don't necessarily see because stressed animals don't want to draw attention to themselves. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I would think in general, green anacondas are going to kind of keep to themselves. There's not any climbing opportunities for this boa, which is sitting down by the water in the corner. But I just find it interesting because anacondas do eat other snakes. That's been recorded. Uh, boas, I don't know how frequently, um, but boas in general across the board, we've had enough occurrences that make people kind of think twice about it. But if they have a lot of space, I mean, I'm sure it can be successful. It's just always a risk and you just want to keep that in mind. Um, this enclosure has uh, an outdoor element to it, and so that's natural sunlight, which is fantastic. Um, boa constrictor enclosures and like arboreal enclosures in general in zoos tend to be kind of difficult because usually you have uh, just the back wall to like build things off of. And in this enclosure, they have a really nice um, setup with rock work and perching that supports the red tail. The red tail's on the bottom, that's a pretty big snake. Um, so there's natural exposure to sunlight, natural heat, I would assume. Um, I believe this was in California. I can't remember the exact institution, but they has an opportunity to soak, which is fantastic. This is also just a really aesthetically pleasing enclosure. Um, beautiful kind of gallery style. This is what I was talking about. It's um, You usually have limited space, and then the space that you do have um, if you build it up anymore, it's going to take up room. So there's rock work in this enclosure along the walls and there's some perching, but if you built this out much more, you might run into issues with just um, general space for the snake to be comfortable. That's a gorgeous red tail. Um, but this is a pretty common setup for a red tail boa and there's little lips where the snake can rest. rest. Uh, they climb a ton when they're little because they're food for all sorts of things. And then as they get larger, sometimes they'll spend more time on the ground. But if they can climb a tree that can support them, they'll take advantage of that also. It just is typically the case. Typically the case is the snake is more comfortable resting on the ground because perching is usually done so poorly. And I don't mean poorly as in like um, neglectful. It's just it can be difficult to create perching without creating other issues that can come um, that other issues that can come in terms of like servicing the enclosure, moving around in the exhibit, um, being able to clean the exhibit. So if the door is in the back of this enclosure to go to the front left to get, you know, fecal and urate is going to be challenging. And if you add a bunch of big logs, um, 
you're going to have to navigate that. And that's typically not what's catered to in a zoo setting, which is understandable. However, then you end up uh, with an arboreal snake that spends a lot of time on the ground. And so creating natural perching and having it um, still be able to support the snake can be challenging um, because for some of these larger snakes, they kind of like that flat platform surface. And you can do that with logs and rocks and things like that, but it's not always going to be available to you. You kind of have to work with um, the enclosures that are set up. This is a beautiful enclosure. It's a good size for the snake, which I can appreciate. There's live plants that helps contribute to humidity. There's a place for it to shelter, which is important as well. So red tails um, will take advantage of dark enclosed spaces. Snakes like to be able to kind of curl up and touch all walls of their shelter. Uh, makes them feel secure. Red tails will also sit out in the open. They're not particularly shy species, so it's not the um, end of the world if they don't have the choice, but it is important for them to have visual barriers and uh, physical barriers in the case of other, other snakes that might be in the enclosure. But this has a pool for soaking as well. It has um, logs for perching that snake could sit on those absolutely if it wanted to. Natural substrate, usually boa constrictor setups are pretty, are pretty standard. Most people know they need to climb. I thought this was very interesting. Um, this is a red tail enclosure that is not enclosed. Um, it makes me very curious about touching the animal, um, but it's this is pretty interesting. Um, temperature parameters, that's a good question. If this building is between 80 and 90, then it's fine. There's a heat lamp, but I can imagine that the humidity would be difficult to influence, but it really depends um, on if you have a hot and muggy reptile house, which I can't imagine visitors would enjoy. But this open air um, display definitely I would imagine gets people interested um, and that snake has excellent places for perching. It's appropriate for its body size. This is at St. Louis Zoo. So St. Louis Zoo is in Missouri, which is a temperate area. And so during the summer, they have um, kind of an outdoor enrichment space that they will rotate their reptiles through. And I thought this was just an interesting setup because I also live in a temperate area and um, we don't really have the enclosure space in our zoo to rotate reptiles through. But you can put together kind of a simple wooden structure like this with screening. And then um, if you want to do, like obviously you want it to look natural, but if you're trading through snakes, especially that are separated like from other buildings, you want to make sure that you disinfect everything in between. But I think giving snakes access to outdoor spaces is very important. Um, it kind of exposes them. Well, honestly, one of the most enriching things that I think a lot of reptiles can experience is wind. That sounds weird, but they are not exposed to wind in their enclosures, or if it, they do, it's very limited, and wind brings in all sorts of scents, and with snakes, you know, scent alone is very important to them, and uh, I think it's just enriching for them to be outside just for those factors alone, and so this is an example of something that you can do seasonally if you want to give your snakes access to outdoors. Where's my UV? Did I put UV on here? like three of my slides disappeared right at the end of this. Sorry, give me one moment. How professional. No. Well, UV lighting for snakes, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Um, if you have the capability to provide it, um, snakes for the longest time have not been housed with UV lighting and they have done just fine as you know as far as the hobby and profession and everything is concerned uh, but we know now obviously animals that are living outside in the wild are going to be exposed to UV lighting at some point um, to some capacity and one thing that you want to do if you are providing UV is making sure it's not too intense for the height of the enclosure um, these are rainforest species, and so you don't want to use high intensity like desert lights, um, some of the desert intensity UVs, and then making sure you know the UV range, um, the UV output, and how it's distributed in the enclosure. And um, you want to get a UV reader because there's really no way to tell without it, um, besides like some charts where you, your UV might sit. And so there are lower UV uh, 
Yeah, lower UV bulbs for rainforest species that are worth looking into, especially if you have a smaller enclosure and you just want to provide them the choice to have access to UV. And that's pretty standard um, across most institutions. They're not like this long-winded topic because snakes usually eat mice and rats and there you go. Um, and while they will eat rodents, it's important to keep in mind some of their other prey items in the wild. Um, some of my favorite photos of wildlife are snakes subduing um, crazy prey in terms of something that you'd never see them interact with it and also really challenging or large prey for that species and boa's ability to catch and subdue large birds is always it's very impressive um obviously if you know anything about macaws and parrots uh, they have incredibly strong bite and could absolutely al almost completely sever a snake in half in some cases even one this size from biting but this snake was able to subdue it and if you weren't aware this is something that I think we're still telling people, even though it was kind of figured out not recently, that constrictors are not built to crush their prey. So breaking bones is not the focus. Um, their focus is cutting off blood circulation, uh, reducing heart rate, and having the animal kind of faint, and then obviously it's going to suffocate at that point. But even in large constrictors, the amount of pressure applied is pretty um, particular, and they use it to quickly um, cause the prey to become unconscious, which is important, and then soon after, obviously, they're going to pass away. But if you're a large snake going with large prey or difficult prey, like something like a macaw, you obviously want to be very strong so that you can subdue your prey because you're not armored like an alligator or a crocodile. And so snake scales protect their skin, but it's not heavy duty protection like you see in other reptiles. They are very susceptible to bites and scratches and lacerations and that type of thing. And so they take a lot of risk in catching large prey items. They're opportunistic predators, which means they're pretty generalist. I mean, snakes are pretty, excuse me, opportunistic. Goodness, that was disgusting. Opportunistic. And so they'll eat a variety of food items, especially as juveniles. As they get larger, obviously their prey is also going to increase in size. And in some populations, you see a higher consumption of birds. In other populations, you see a higher consumption of mammals. Um, we found through um, looking at other generalist reptile species that it really has to do with prey abundance. Uh, and prey occurrence. So what's common in their area? What do they normally interact with and learn how to handle and subdue? And they love birds. Boas and a lot of python species, um, a lot of snakes in general that aren't specialists, they do like birds. I don't know what it is about them, but that's definitely something that can be tried if you have a constrictor that goes off feed um, using birds, quails, uh, chickens, that can entice some snakes just because there's something about it. So usually in um, captivity, in terms of feeding, you have access to quail and chickens of various sizes in terms of frozen thawed prey. Uh, for rodents, I would only really recommend mice and rats. Um, rats have a pretty high fat content. Mice, it's higher, but rats, it's high, especially if you get um, like breeder males that are heavier. Um, and if they're fed frequently, if you feed rats and you do it um, less often than you would some of these leaner species, then you're fine. But feeding frequently can lead to obesity, um, even like subtle obesity snakes. <laughs> subtle obesity. Snakes don't get big and rolly and bulgy until they're pretty heavy. Um, but there is certain kind of signs with body condition that you want to keep an eye on. Um, and then there's been issues in other species with fur, um, heavily furred animals like rats and rabbits, and some species can cause constipation. Um, some species also just don't like the texture of fur, which is interesting. That's an interesting choice to me. Uh, snakes, certain species of snakes we've seen uh, regurge feathers. They can also pass feathers. It's not really a protein that's used by their bodies. Uh, but it doesn't affect their body. I would think if you're looking between digestion of the two, the fur is going to cause more complex issues, especially if it's paired with poor husbandry. And feeding frequency, again, it needs to be, in reptiles, it's a combination of four things, which we'll talk about in the next slide. This is a boa eating of a black vulture, which is awesome. It's insane. These are strong birds. Birds, um, 
catching them out of the air, catching them in trees requires a lot of strength and skill. And Bo has developed that over lots of practice from juvenile to adulthood. So looking at feeding frequency, um, if this was set up like a course, we would spend quite a bit of time talking about monitoring these things, looking at different types of behaviors, looking at their life stage. Um, this is a huge boa. So this is a wild adult foal. This is a big snake. And so in terms of body condition, there's a couple things that you wanna look for, which we'll talk about in a moment. But when it comes to feeding frequency, you can do weekly. Uh, with juveniles, they're gonna be growing quickly. and that's an adaptation in order to outgrow their predators. So the bigger they are, the fewer animals are usually able to subdue them. And so they're gonna have quite an appetite and a lot of their um, food consumption is going to go into growth. So it's not until they reach sexual maturity where in full size where they'll start to plateau. And that's where those items and those calories kind of start to count, especially if uh, they are, uh, active individuals or they're not given the opportunity to be active, that's when you wanna start watching food intake and body condition. So life stages influences that. Also, if it's a breeding female, they go on and off feed and that can influence their appetite, their interest in food. And then weight, um, this is something that you learn from mammals. You have weight and then you have body condition and you really have to incorporate both when making decisions about nutrition and um, animal management in general. So it's important to regularly weigh reptiles um, in, and a lot of reptiles are smaller so that weight change um, can seem small in amount, but it can be um, a big implication of an issue in a small animal to lose a lot of weight or gain a lot of weight. Um, if an animal's not eating and it's gaining weight, that's something that we've seen in, in large constrictors and that can be um, having um, infertilized ova can develop and you'll see an increase in weight. It can also be a tumor, which I've seen um, a couple of times where the snake is not eating, but you see the weight increasing. Um, and that's something that you want to take a look at, especially if you're not like purposefully breeding the snake and you know that it's not gravid. So body condition in boas. So these are just some examples. I don't have any good photos of the boas that I've worked with. So I pulled some beautiful ones off the internet. But boas, which I think you can see my cursor because you usually can. We talked about that tall body shape. So they're kind of, I don't, I can't think of the word for it. They just have a tall body and they kind of have a loaf of bread cross section. And they have that throughout their life. It's usually pretty distinct when they're little. Um, as they get older and larger, you see more of that tallness um, in the first three quarters and then usually heaviness, sometimes especially in females. And then it goes down to their little red tail, which isn't always red. Um, all of their body is incredibly strong. They can hang off of a small portion of their tail and hold their weight. Uh, they're very solidly built. And as they get older and larger, especially in females, they do start to bulk up. So this snake on the bottom left, this is an adult female. This is pretty good body condition. Um, they have a, dis there's a distinct head. You still see that height. There's no, you'll, you'll see creasing at the corners because their skin is elastic and so it folds. Um, but if you're seeing like rolls, I couldn't find a good example. Thank God. There's a lot for like Burmese pythons. Um, like this is normal here. That's just normal. You don't have any like big bumps. Sometimes when they're really obese, they'll get bumpy. But usually in uh, other constrictors, you would look more at the dip behind the head to the neck, which this is full. Um, but they don't have quite the distinction that you might see in something like a python, but also their tail. So as you go towards the tail, great, I didn't choose a photo, but they tend to have a, a fluid narrowing of the tail. Um, you don't really have that distinction of where their vent is if you're looking at it from above, but sometimes in very heavy snakes, you'll have a big full body and then a little tail. So very fat, and then that's where the vent is and then their tail's very thin and that's that's either a gravid female, a snake that's about to poop or an overweight snake and you can usually tell. Um, I have one other note, but I don't think I'm gonna get to it. So all of these snakes are good body condition. They just get bulky as they get older. Talk about, and I'm sure that I missed things. Um, 
but I would love to talk about handling. So handling red tails um, is fun. They're awesome snakes. They're one of the few snakes that you can really use for programming that you can have them positioned on you and they hold themselves and you don't really have to do much compared to more um, terrestrial or aquatic species. Like when you hold berms, berms don't set an anchor, which is where they wrap their tail around you. Um, that tends to scare people when they have any sort of wrapping. The indication to a lot of people is that they're going to be constricted. And when you hold boas, they're being held off the ground and their specialty is keeping themselves secure. And so they'll typically secure their body around your arm. In a larger snake, you can have them secure around your middle. And that type of constriction is not an indicator of aggression or predation. Um, the other thing is they tend to climb. And if they climb and they use, like you don't want them around your neck because their perching behavior and perching strength can apply pressure that makes you uncomfortable. And that's why I usually recommend like putting them around your middle. Um, that gives them something to hold on to that they're not really going to be able to harm if they're just um, using it as an anchor. Uh, the other thing is they are really good at chin hooking. I can't think of another word for it, but if they can get their chin onto something, they can pull their entire body up to it. And you have to back up to get their chin off. That is just their instinct, their skill. They get their head and neck around something and they can pull the rest of themselves up. And so you have to be aware of the props and items around you. Uh, large snakes should be handled by two people. The only problem is, is that these snakes are fully capable of um, holding the front half of their body off the ground if they have a good anchor. And so they're not going to be shareable like a lot of uh, like Burmese. Burmese pythons are used so much. Um, you, having two people hold them helps them. It helps their back. It helps them feel more comfortable. But sometimes with boas, like in this photo, there's a second person holding the back end. Boas have a tendency to back up and they'll back right out of that second handler's hand because that's just what they do. And so it can be harder to maneuver them and make it look professional when you have two people. Um, but it's important to have a second person there um, in case the snake... Um, anchors in a way that makes the handler uncomfortable. You want to be able to unwrap them. I don't want to really, like boa constrictors are fantastic. They don't have a lot of aggressive behaviors. They sometimes do when they're younger, but if you handle them for education, for example, um, the risk of them biting and constricting during handling is pretty slim. Um, they might do a defensive bite which is a bite and release. And that's typically if they're touched too close to their head or neck, they're very sensitive in that area. Uh, the back half of their body is usually a good place to touch. Um, biting and constricting is usually something that occurs during feeding. Um, it occurs when improper tools are used or people feed by hand. Um, that is a, an instinctual behavioral response to uh, what they perceive to be prey. And so they'll put all their power into subduing whatever they grabbed. Um, again, because in the in their natural environment, they are um, required to subdue prey while being many feet off the ground. And so that's a situation where you would need a second person to help you. Um, I don't know how frequent, I don't know. I don't know if I know of any deaths from red tails off the top of my head, but it's just important because these are powerful animals and a bite from an adult is powerful that when you feed them, you're very careful. And that's something that I wanted to talk about, but the time factor. Um, they have pretty good indicators. They're good hissers. So they're good hissers in terms of when they start to get pissed off, they'll hiss. Um, they usually don't passively hiss like some other species like hognose snakes that can be pretty vocal. Um, they're not indiscriminate hissers, and usually if you hear a red tail hiss, it's time for them to go back. If that is paired with um, a, a loaded spring head and neck position, not where they're backing up. A lot of times when people see red tails back up, they have that S position, but it's just reverse. But if it's tight and you see uh, frequent long length tongue flicking, which is usually something that they do when they're irritated. And you see that in some species. Um, 
And then obviously hissing and like a coiled up position, there's a variety of indicators that tell you that that snake is mad and it might bite you. Uh, but typically boas are very exploratory when you handle them. They like to, they well obviously they love to smell what's going on. They'll try to get close to you and climb on anything that's near them. Um, and they're usually very much into their environment more than the people interacting with them, which is a benefit. Um, so I love red tails. They were always some of my favorites, especially um, working with them in berms in terms of load on the body. Red tails are fun because they get comfortable and you don't have to do too much. So a couple other notes, there's a million things that we could talk about. Um, it's important that reptiles are given um, regular visual and physical exams. So these are animals that need to be looked at daily. You want to make sure you're looking at their scales and skin, their face. Uh, if you have cage mates, make sure that you know that they can be eaten and uh, <laughs> that you uh, have a conversation about how you think those animals are going to be managed in that exhibit. If you need to increase visual barriers, physical barriers, there's ways to house snakes together, but there's always, absolutely always a risk that somebody's going to get eaten. Um, and that's how we're continuously surprised is because we try it. And then um, sometimes it doesn't work right away. Sometimes it can be years later that a snake will decide, now I'm, now I'm going to eat you. It's bizarre. Make sure you keep their enclosure clean. One big issue with very large adults is just the amount of urine and urate that they produce when they go to the bathroom. That tends to soak substrate. And while you pick up the urate, which is the chalky white blobs that looks like egg, um, sometimes you pick that up, but it's already, there's been quite a bit of urine that's soaked in. So there's, there's quite a bit of liquid urine from these species. And you just want to make sure that you're doing frequent substrate changes so that you avoid that kind of saturation. And most welfare issues when it comes to snakes in particular, if there's no physical condition that's causing it, um, you can usually start looking at your husbandry parameters um, how the exhibit is set up and starting with temperature in particular, temperature gradient, um, highs and lows, the drafts, the humidity, there's a variety of things that you can kind of check in on to make sure that the environment helps to support the animal and then problem solve from there. Um, I will be doing more series, I think, on snake welfare because I haven't done that yet, but we usually go through individual welfare issues and kind of uh, a map of where you go next if you are looking at a particular welfare problem like a lethargic individual, aggressive individual, um, an animal that does not have an appetite, uh, that type of thing. Because if you are not trained in reptiles, sometimes the subtleties that lead to major things like um, a snake stops eating, um, it's usually not just one random thing that makes them stop eating. Uh, unless they've recently had a stressful event, but there might be long-term uh, husbandry issue that contributes to the, a body condition that then affects appetite. And so those are important to figure out, um, even for your really small snakes and things like that. They just deserve the attention. And I think that we should wrap it up. <laughs> I appreciate your time.